bogeyman, so to speak, in American consciousness is the idea that you can have a black male in your home. And they found this so offensive, they refused to check what they were like, whichever child was in need. And so, lo and behold, they got an African-American child, a boy. And this boy, they, they got him, and they decided, well, they have an African-American boy, and they're going to raise him as who they are. They are Jews. He'll be raised as a Jew. And they named him Jonah, started the process, and that's when they began to encounter the world of American race relations in relation to Judaism. Because on the one hand, we have these, we, we have this, this statement in the American experience in which we say Judaism is a religion. And as a religion then, there is, there is no, there should not be any race issue at all. All, in other words, if you have a religion, then people from a variety of racial backgrounds practice that religion. So why, then, is it one of those things like, you know, the party's going and suddenly, you know, the DJ's going, so you hear the, 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 the vinyl scratch. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the party stops when he shows up yeah. with his black shot. Right? Why is this going on? And this now brings out the Tobins. Because, you see, to give you a little background on who Gary Tobin was, he was a young man from... St. Louis, Missouri. He is from a, was from a secular Jewish background. Right? As a child, he was very creative. In fact, one of the things I came across after he died was his high school, one of his high school projects, where he outlined and had all kinds of things about dealing with communities, and he, he, he had all kinds of, of drawings and ideas. Very, very vibrant person. He studied, he did his PhD in urban planning at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And when he went to teach in St. Louis, he got involved in Jewish issues because he was concerned about how, in the way Jews were counted, a lot of Jews, well, didn't count. And you could see how his training in urban planning connects to this because, you know, as an urban planner, his view was very pragmatic. If there's something wrong, what do you do to fix it? How do you get things done? And so he got involved in debates with individuals in Jewish demography. And in those debates, he began to, it, it, this led to his moving to Brandeis, running a center. And it led to him realizing if he's going to be in these debates, he needs to understand more about Judaism than simply being a born Jew. And so this led, although he was already a Jew, this led to him going through the process of becoming a member of a conservative Jewish synagogue. And he would publicly present himself as a convert, although he was already a born Jew. And this is a theme with many Jews, especially many African American Jews, that a lot of us don't realize, that many, I've discovered a lot of the community I meet who are converts are people already born Jews. But what found the conversion process is a way of learning about Judaism. And so, as he was involved in these issues, he got involved in a lot of other Jewish issues, particularly issues around the, the question of the state of Israel, and around questions in terms of conflicts around civil rights. And as, uh, as uh, Capers remarked in our podcast, well, he was the most, how can you put it, the most liberal Republican he ever met. And, uh, and by this, you know, we forget, you know, I've heard this quite a bit. It's funny how many people, also on the left, lament the demise of liberal Republicans. But what this was about was a situation in which, when he saw the situation in the academy at Brandeis, you know, you work really hard, you get a lot of funding, you build centers, but as you know, um, universities can also be very brutal places. And they're places in which um, it is possible to, 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 in spite of his liberal republicanism, experience what Marx would call, well, alienation. <laughs> and I mean the Marxist sense of alienation, right? 
And so he realized that to not be alienated from his labor, he and his wife, Diane Tobin, created the Institute for Jewish Research and Community because they wanted to be able to set the conditions of offering an alternative understanding of Jewish life. And it was in that context that the Chol Hashem, in every tongue, was created. Now this, this rubric led to a situation in which he began to argue, for instance, in opening the gates, he began to argue around how Jewish communities need to be more welcoming. And you know, one of the odd things, especially if you do work on, 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 on race and social thought, and if you do work on Jews in particular, one thing I always mention when I speak at synagogues is it's incredible how much, um, especially Jews, don't know about Jewish history. You know? So there's this belief, for instance, that this thing about keeping, you know, not bringing people into Judaism, being insular, is Jewish. But it actually isn't Jewish. It was something imposed upon Jews in 312 under the period of Constantine. When a Roman emperor facing Jewish proselytizers and Christian proselytizers <laughs> became Christian. And there were laws implemented that if Jews were to convert people to Judaism, they were punishable, it was punishable by death. Now you can imagine, by the way, I, I usually bring this up to, to, to folks, you can imagine if you are in a community where marriage, for instance, is premised upon someone being brought into the community, well, bringing someone to the community could be published, pun punishable by death. That's a pretty surefire way to make Jews insular, isn't it? And you know, what's funny about it is, you know, again, that period of proselytizing in the past was a period, for instance, in the Roman Empire, for before Constantine, where Jewish populations grew significantly. You know, the difference between the people in Judea and people around the other areas of the Roman Empire was a period in which, under a period of 150 years, Within the Roman Empire, populations of people today, whom we will call Jews, went from 150,000 to 8 million. That means that there was a large population of what we would today call converts. But here's the crucial thing. When that edict was placed in 312, it meant that that population within the Roman terrain was pretty much frozen in, in genetics terms in history. And that's why that group, when many people think of Jews today, they're really thinking of what a Roman looked like in 312 ACE. <laughs> what they don't realize, though, is that the Roman Empire was vast. It included North Africa. It included parts of East Africa. And even outside of the Roman Empire, there were also the diaspora of Judeans throughout the Persian areas, India, all these other areas. And this led to very interesting developments. When, if one is going to talk about Judaism and race, one is automatically, from this narrative I just gave you, talking about a multiracial population. Okay? And one of the things one has to realize then is the kind of work that every tongue was doing, or what we do at the Center for Afro Jewish Studies. When we say Afro Jews, for instance, we do not mean Afro as monolithical or Jews as monolithical. As we know, we're talking about two highly diverse communities meeting to create even more diversity. But one of the things we begin to realize is talk about race and talk about Jews together becomes more complicated than many of us may think. And, I, and right now I'm giving a short introduction, so I'll just make two remarks and then we begin to connect it through. You could see, for instance, that I'm raising this problem of history because it connects to the question of memory. And that's one of the reasons why we'll have Professor Levitt speak. But right now, I'll give you two discourses that will give you what I mean. As we know, in recent, <coughs> in terms of politics, particularly in the United States over the past 40, 40 to 50 years, there's a lot of antipathy to talking about race, while we're in a heavily racialized situation. And particularly with <coughs> Jewish Americans, 
There's a lot of antipathy to talking about race. But what's odd about 